أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Inshallah ta'ala, this is the first of many episodes in which we're going to make the tafsir of the Qur'an page by page. So inshallah ta'ala, in every single episode, our aim is to take one page of the Qur'an, start from the beginning and work our way all the way towards the end of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So today we begin with Surah Al-Fatiha, the first chapter of the Qur'an. And Surah Al-Fatiha means the opening. And as we all know, it is the most important surah of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the greatest surah in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. And there are a number of hadith that speak to the virtues of this particular surah. And it is enough for us to all know that it is something which is considered to be one of the major aspects of our salah. In every single prayer that we offer, in every single unit of that prayer, in every single rak'ah, we will recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And that is because it is a surah that contains so many lessons and so many benefits and so many important principles for the Muslim. And those principles, inshallah ta'ala, some of them and some of the most important ones we will touch upon today. The surah, surah al-Fatiha, which means literally the opening, the first surah of the Qur'an, is a surah that has been mentioned in the sunnah in a number of hadith that speak to the virtues of this surah. From them is the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, on the authority of the companion Abu Sa'id ibn al-Mu'alla, radiyallahu an, that he was once praying in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's masjid, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him, but he was slow in responding because he was finishing off his prayer, his voluntary prayer. He eventually comes to the Prophet wasallam, and the Prophet wasallam says, and I'm, I'm abridging the hadith, summarizing the hadith. He says to him, I will teach you before we leave the masjid today, what is the greatest surah of the Quran. So then they begin to talk about other things. And as they're walking towards the masjid exit, Abu Sa'id says to the Prophet wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, you said, that you would teach me what is the greatest surah of the Qur'an before we left the masjid. And so the Prophet ﷺ replied, It is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, meaning Surah Al-Fatiha. It is the Sab'ul Mathani, the seven oft-repeated verses, Wal Qur'an al and the great Qur'an that I have been given. So this hadith shows to us that the surah that is Surah Al-Fatiha also has a number of names by which it is known. From the names that it is known by, is Sab'ul Mathani, the seven oft-repeated verses, and that is because it is repeated constantly in every single rak'ah of every single prayer. It is also known as the Qur'an al azim from its names, is that it is the great Qur'an, meaning it is the greatest surah of the Qur'an, and that is because, as we said, it is in almost, uh, in, in a manner of speaking, it is something which summarizes the whole book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the names of this surah is that it is known as Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book. And that is because the Arabs call something the um. The um kind of means like the you know the the, the major uh, or, or the or the master copy, or if you like, it is the mother of something or the main uh, source of something. The Arabs call something the um if it is considered to be the greatest of its type. So, for example, Umm al Qura, the mother of all cities or all towns, is the city of Mecca because it is the greatest of its type. So likewise, Surah Al-Fatiha is considered to be Umm Al-Kitab, the greatest of the surahs of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we say that something is the greatest surah or the greatest verse in the Quran, it doesn't in any way diminish the rest of the Book of Allah Azza wa We don't mean that it is something which means that you can then ignore other parts of the Quran or the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what it means is that Allah Azza wa has given to it extra virtue or extra reward or has placed upon it certain emphasis that you don't find elsewhere for other surahs or other verses of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the virtues of this surah is also what is mentioned in the hadith of Ibn Abbas uh, radiallahu anhuma in Sahih Muslim and that is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was once with Jibreel alayhi salam and this hadith speaks about the revelation of surah al-Fatiha. He was once with Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam and they heard a sound from above, a sound that they had never heard before. 
So Jibreel alayhi salam looked above and he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, today a gate has been opened in the heavens. Never before has such a gate been opened, meaning never before has that particular gate been opened. And from that gate there descended another angel. The angel came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he said, I give you glad tidings of the two lights that Allah Azza wa has given to you, no one before you was given them, meaning no Prophet or Messenger of Allah received such revelation. And then the angel said, the first light is Surah Al-Fatiha, and the second light are the last couple of verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. These are things that Allah Azza wa gave specifically to His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and therefore, by extension, He gave them specifically to this Ummah, to me and to you as well. From the virtues of this surah is what is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an in uh, the famous hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says concerning the person who is in salah and they're praying and they're reciting surah al-fatiha that Allah azza wa says qasamtu salata bayni wa bayna abdi he says Allah azza wa says that I have made the salah meaning Surah Al-Fatiha, so from the names of Surah Al-Fatiha, is that it is also known as the Salah or the prayer. I have made the Salah, meaning Surah Al-Fatiha, in two halves. One half is for me and one half is for my servant. So when the servant says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of all that exists, Allah Azza wa replies, Hamidani Abdi, my servant has praised me. And then when the servant says in the recitation of the surah, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, that Allah Azza wa is the one who is the Lord of all mercy and the one who gives all mercy. Likewise, Allah Azza wa replies, Athna Ali Ya Abdi, my servant has spoken good of me. And when he says, the servant Maliki Yawmiddin, that Allah Azza wa is the master, the owner of the day of judgment. Allah Azza wa replies, Majjadani Abdi, my slave has glorified me. And then when the slave says or the servant says, You alone, O Allah, do we worship and you alone do we seek assistance from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is between me and my servant and I will give to my servant that which he asks for. And then the rest of the surah, When that person makes that dua and asks Allah Azza wa to guide them to the straight path, the path that Allah Azza wa has favored, not the path of those who have been led astray or those who have incurred the wrath and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Azza wa says, likewise, this is between me and my slave and I will give to him that which he asks for. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds every single time we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah Azza wa Jal in Salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds accordingly as is mentioned in this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from the virtues of this Surah, is that which is mentioned also in Sahih al-Bukhari in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an. And that is that this Surah is something which contains within it a shifa, a cure. It is something which a person can use to make ruqya, incantation upon themselves. They can recite it and blow over their hands and wipe over their body, the place that they're feeling pain or illness or sickness. And by Allah's permission, it is something which grants cure and grants relief. This is seen in the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an, when a group of companions were traveling. And they descended at night as people would do in those early days. They descended at night upon a group of people in the village and they asked them for their hospitality to give them a place to stay and to give them some food. And that was the norm in a time before hotels and before Airbnbs and before all of this type of stuff that we're used to now. People would go and they would ask people of those towns and villages respectively to give them some hospitality in terms of shelter for the night and food and drink. Those people of that particular town or village, they refused to do so. So they were people who were stingy, people miserly, people not known for their hospitality. And so the companions, they moved a short distance away from that village and they chose to spend the night there instead. But as they were settling down for the night, the leader or one of the leaders of that town of that village, he was stung by some type of insect. And so he became feverish and became ill. And they tried different types of medications that they had access to, different types of things, but they couldn't help that man. So someone said, why don't you go and ask those guests, those strangers, those visitors, maybe they have something. So one of them went and they spoke to those people, those companions, and they said, is there amongst you someone who can help in this situation? One of the companions said, I will, I will do so. But when we asked you for your hospitality, you refused. So now 
I will not agree to this until you allow or you agree to give me something in return, some type of reward, some type of payment. So they agreed that they would give them a certain set amount of sheep as payment, some type of of cattle as payment. And then that companion went and he recited over this non-Muslim, he recited over him Surah Al-Fatiha. And by Allah's permission, he was cured. So they took those uh, those animals and they decided that they would wait until they go back to the Prophet وسلم, so that they could ensure that what they had done was correct and that the money that they'd taken or that payment that they had received was something which was legitimate. They came to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet وسلم, said to them, how did you know that Surah Al-Fatiha is a ruqya? How did you know that it's something which serves as, as an incantation, something which you can recite that by Allah's permission, it is something which cures or it relieves distress and pain. And then the Prophet wasallam told them to distribute the payment that they had received amongst them and to give him a share as well. So Surah Al-Fatiha, if a person has Iman, because in that hadith, the man that they're reciting over is a non-Muslim. Imagine then that if you're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha over a person who believes in Allah, who believes in the Quran, who loves the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who wants to come close to Allah azza wa jal, comes close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the recitation of his words. For such a person, it is undoubtedly a shifa, a cure, something which is a rahmah and a barakah, a blessing and a mercy for those types of people. And so this is just one of those many hadith, a number of them I've mentioned to you today, uh, that speak about the virtue of this surah. It is an amazing surah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The method of our tafsir is essentially to give us a holistic understanding of the verses of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not meant to be in-depth, detailed tafsir, nor is it meant to be one when we speak about the different positions amongst the scholars of tafsir, because undoubtedly in some of these verses there may be varying opinions or differences amongst the scholars of tafsir of old and of new. But this, inshallah ta'ala, this series is meant to give us a general understanding of the book of Allah azza wa jal in accordance to the understanding of the salaf the understanding of the companions and their students, the tabi'een and those early generations of scholars and Muslims, how do they understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these verses and what they understood these verses to mean and to refer to. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this surah. And before we begin in the recitation of the Quran, we always begin with the isti'adha, to say, A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim And that is something which is a sunnah that before you begin the recitation of anything of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's the beginning of a surah or midway in a surah, you begin by asking Allah azza wa jal to save you, to give you refuge from shaitan. And that is the command that Allah azza wa jal himself mentions in the Quran when he says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When wanting to recite the Quran, then seek Allah's refuge in shaitan the accursed. Also, from that which is highly recommended is to recite the, the Basmalah. The Basmalah refers to the statement Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which we find at the beginning of every single surah of the Quran, with the exception of one surah, and that is Surah At-Tawbah. To also do that at the beginning of every surah, it is something which is also highly recommended. Surah Al-Fatiha begins with the Basmalah, to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, that Allah Azza wa Jal is the most gracious and that He is the most merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal then says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all that exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the Quran with this word and this command of praise. And to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means to speak of Allah Azza wa Jal in every single manner which is befitting to Him of good to affirm for him his perfection subhanahu wa ta'ala and his completeness in every way, shape and form and that Allah Azza wa Jal is unique in every single way subhanahu wa ta'ala unlike any of his creation Jalla fi ula. And that we say and we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sense of love and a sense of servitude and worship and humility and humbleness before him subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is essentially hamd. And Allah Azza wa Jal begins the Quran with alhamd. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the people of Jannah when they enter into Jannah, their final call will be to say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. To praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise Him because He is befitting of all praise. He is worthy of all praise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who most loves to be praised 
and he is most worthy of that praise subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to constantly praise Allah Azza wa Jal, to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remember Allah Azza wa Jal by reciting the Quran and by making adhkar and by making dua, it is something which is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, it is almost as if he begins the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, his book, by this instruction that we should be people who constantly and continuously praise him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, all of that praise belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal alone. He alone is befitting and worthy of that praise subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbil Alameen, He is the Lord of all that exists. The Lord is the one who is the owner, the one who is the leader, the one who nurtures, the one who, who helps, the one who rectifies. He is the one who we call in the Arabic language a Rabb, and He is the one who is worthy of all worship subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal is our Rabb. He is the one who created us. He is the one who fashioned us. He is the one who gave us life. He is the one who provides for us. He is the one who decrees for us life and death, harm and benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who commanded us to worship him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore we offer all forms of legitimate worship to him. Jalla fi ula. He is the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all that exists. And the Alam is everything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything that is creation, because Allah is the creator, everything besides him is creation. Everything besides him is called Al-Alam. So we offer Allah Azza wa Jal this praise and it is the most amazing praise, so comprehensive in this verse in Surah Al-Fatiha. That we praise Allah Azza wa Jal with love, with humility, with a sense of servitude and worship to the one who is the creator, the sustainer, the provider, the one who decrees for us all good and all harm and the one who gives us life and death and he is the one who is the Lord of everything in existence. And because therefore he is the Lord of everything in existence, he alone is worthy of worship subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us and describes to us that he is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim the one who is most gracious, most merciful, or the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the main themes in the Quran is his names and attributes, because Allah azza wa jal wants us to know him. And the way that we get to know our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is through his description of himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more that you learn about Allah, his names, his attributes, the more that you worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala and you grow in your love of him and your iman in him subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal that is most mentioned and repeated in the Quran is that He is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. That Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who is all merciful. And that His mercy is something which is a sifatun dhatiya. It is an attribute which belongs to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is one that He gives to Himsoever He wills from His creation. And that Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy is one which is general, that everything in existence benefits from. The Muslims and the non-Muslims, the humans and the jinn and the animals and the plants, that which is living and that which is no longer in existence, everything belongs to Allah Azza wa Jal and everything benefits from His mercy. But then there is also a form of His mercy that is specific for the believers in this life and more importantly on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And that is why the Prophet wasallam told us, as you know in that famous hadith, no one will enter into Jannah except by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. So they said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, no one will enter into Jannah unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one will enter into Jannah by virtue of their own deeds, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, not even you, O Messenger of Allah. He said, not even me, unless Allah azza wa showers his mercy upon me. That is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the mercy of Allah azza wa jal that we were created, that we were provided for, that we have family, that we have good health, that we live in a relative sense of safety and security. But moreover, from the greatest mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will touch upon in a few verses in Surah Al-Fatiha, and that is that Allah Azza wa Jal gave us his guidance, showed us the way to Islam, allowed us to accept this religion, to believe in him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship him alone, to accept the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his final messenger, to use the Quran as a book that will guide us and bring us closer to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is all from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal is that the people who live in accordance to those teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah, they will be given that immense reward on Yawm Al-Qiyamah by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, he links that mercy 
with the next verse and that description and that attribute of Allah Azza wa Jal that he is Maliki Yawmiddin, the owner, the master, the king of the day of judgment. In this world, there are different kings and different leaders. And some of those leaders think that they own things or that they have control over things. And to a certain extent, they do. But that kingship, that sovereignty, it is always limited. It is finite. It is weak in one way or another. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his dominion, his kingdom, his sovereignty, it is perfect in every single way. And on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, there will be no other king. There will be no other leader. There will be no other, uh, no other owner or master except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the true kingdom, the kingdom of the next life. And that is where true ownership and true rule will be seen. And that is the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. As Allah Azza wa tells us elsewhere in the Quran, that he will ask on that day, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ Or he will be asked to whom does kingdom belong on this day? And it will be said that it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So after praising Allah Azza wa Jal, and this surah as we said speaks about the principles of our religion. From those principles, or from the greatest of those principles, is the principle of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his tawheed of unifying Allah Azza wa Jal or declaring the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all forms of his lordship and in all forms of his worship and in his unique names and attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is deserving of all worship and that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this surah by telling us about his tawheed, informing us about his lordship, about his names, about his attributes, so that when it comes to worshipping him, we worship him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala in a manner which is befitting to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal then tells us that we make this declaration as we do in every single rak'ah of every single salah that we offer 17 times a day at the very least. We say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ O oh Allah, you alone do we worship, and you alone do we seek assistance from. Now normally in the English language or in any language, the way we would say something is, we worship you alone. We wouldn't say you alone we worship, unless we wanted to emphasize that particular thing. So rather than Allah Azza wa Jal saying we worship him alone, we seek assistance from him alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began by mentioning himself first subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said Iyaka, you alone O oh Allah do we worship you alone O oh Allah do we seek assistance from because that is where the tawheed comes in there are many people in the world who worship many gods and some of them will worship Allah but alongside him they will worship other gods as well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that our religion its cornerstone its foundation is based upon this very principle and that is that we're worshiping Allah alone so we make dua to Allah alone. We seek help from Allah alone. We seek assistance from Allah alone. When we sacrifice, it is for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Any and every single act of worship, whether it's worship of the tongue, worship of the limbs, or worship of the heart, in trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believing in Allah Azza wa Jal, hoping for eternal reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fearing eternal punishment, it is from Allah alone. All of those aspects of worship in whichever form, they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And so we declare this, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ O oh Allah alone, you alone do we worship. And then in return, وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And you alone do we seek assistance from. And that shows to us that that assistance only comes, that second part only comes once the first part has been realized. You realize the first part that Allah Azza wa Jal is worthy of worship alone. You dedicate your life to worshiping Him, to submitting to Him, to following His command subhanahu wa ta'ala, to staying away from His prohibitions. Allah Azza wa Jal says, then you can ask and you can seek assistance and you can seek help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you His divine blessings, His divine mercy and His divine assistance subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ It is almost the pact that we have made. So the first principle in our religion is the principle of the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah Azza wa Jal moves on and he says, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ O oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Keep us firm and steadfast upon the straight path. This is the first dua that is mentioned in the Quran and it is the dua that we most repeat in our lives. Every single day, 17 times a day, we ask Allah for guidance. The wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ummu Salama radiallahu anha was asked, what was the most common dua that you used to hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam make? 
And she said from the most common du'as that I heard him make is the du'a, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O the one who turns the hearts, make my heart steadfast and firm upon your religion. That du'a that the Prophet ﷺ would repeat often and you would make often, it is taken from Surah Al-Fatiha. The Prophet ﷺ best knew and had most knowledge concerning the Qur'an and its tafsir. And often what Allah Azza wa emphasizes in the Qur'an, you will see that the Prophet ﷺ emphasizes the same in the Sunnah because there is no contradiction between the Qur'an and the Sunnah. They work together and one, the Sunnah, explains the Qur'an. And so therefore the Prophet ﷺ often emphasizes what Allah Azza wa has already emphasized in the Qur'an. Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. Keep us firm upon the straight path. And that is because the guidance that we're seeking is of two types. The first is the initial guidance. The guidance of accepting Islam, of being guided to Islam, of accepting the Quran and the Sunnah. That is one type of guidance. But once you've been guided, and once Allah has showered and given you that ability to see that guidance and accept it, then what is the meaning of repeating that dua? It essentially becomes a, O oh Allah, keep us firm upon that guidance dua. It is a dua that, O oh Allah, guide us, meaning continue to guide us to the straight path. Continuously guide us, O oh Allah, to that way, meaning keep us firm, keep us steadfast. And that is what we take from that hadith and that dua of the Prophet wasallam that he understood that meaning. That once you've been guided, what you're asking Allah for is essentially to keep upon that path. And that's an amazing dua. It is something that all of us need. All of us are in need of. Every single day we need Allah's guidance and we need to be kept firm upon this straight path. Because there are some people who are Muslim today, but they may not die upon Islam. May Allah save us from that. And that is why when the people of Jannah will enter into Jannah from the way that they will, from the manners of praise that they will mention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that they will say, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ All oh, praises for Allah, the one who guided us. We would never have been guided were it not for the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa then concludes this surah by telling us the type of guidance, the path that we want to be upon. And the second principle in this surah is this, the path that we want to be upon. What is the sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path? It is the path of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day drew a line on the ground and he said that this is the straight path that takes you to Allah. And then he drew lines to the right and the left and he said, these are the paths that take you away, astray from that straight path. The straight path is to follow what Allah said, to follow what the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the path that Allah describes as being blessed. Sirat al-ladheena na'amta alayhim. This is the path of Allah Azza wa Jal that you have blessed. Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim waladdali. Not the path of those who have incurred your, your, uh, your wrath and your anger. Nor the path of those who went astray. The path of those who are blessed is the path that is straight. They are the people who submit to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah says do something and they do it. Allah says stay away from something, they stay away from it. They learn about their religion more and more so that they can better understand how to stand firm and steadfast upon that straight path. And it is not the path of those who have incurred the wrath of Allah. Those who have incurred the wrath of Allah, some of the scholars of Tafsir said, are those people who have knowledge, but they don't act upon it. They know what is halal and haram. They know what Allah has commanded, but they ignore it and they choose to follow other paths or they choose to do what they wish to do following their desires. And the path of those who have gone astray are those who do the opposite of that first group. The opposite being that they worship Allah based upon no knowledge. They don't know what Allah wants and they worship Him based upon ignorance. The first group knows, but they choose to ignore. The second group doesn't ignore, but they worship based upon no knowledge. So both of them have gone astray. Because in order, therefore, for you to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is the third principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us how to ascertain what is the straight path, and that is that you need both knowledge and action. Learn your religion. Learn the tafsir of the Qur'an. Learn the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then act in accordance to it. And that is why after reciting this surah, in salah, and sometimes even outside of salah, you can say ameen, which means, oh Allah, accept this dua. 
This is the dua of every Muslim that we recite each and every single day, multiple times a day, that we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his forgiveness and mercy upon us, to give us his guidance and to keep us firm upon that. May Allah azza wa jal make us form amongst those people. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.